Welcome to, uh, to the second panel. I think this one should be uh, very exciting. Uh, let me uh, briefly introduce our panelists um, I th um, and uh, t t talk a little bit about the history here. So our first panelist immediately to my left is Jason Livingood, who's uh, the Vice President for Internet Services at Comcast. He's been at Comcast since 1996, so I don't have time to go through all of his esteemed accomplishments while he's, while he's been there. But uh, he um, is responsible for Comcast's residential and commercial internet services architecture, engineering, and operations. He also serves on the BTAG, um, so we've had a lot of interaction uh, in that capacity as well. So, um, and uh, I, I think, you know, sort of off the bio script, I can say I've, I've always been extremely uh, impressed with uh, Jason's um, sort of engineering acumen and, and, and ability to bring uh, really reasoned technical discussion to debate such as the one I think uh, we're about to have. Did I say debate? Um, <laughs> okay. Um, then uh, uh, immediately to, to Jason's left is Colin Anderson. Uh, who is, is uh, really, I think, uh, is, a, is a pioneer in, in the space here of, of measuring interconnection. Uh, he is a researcher at um, the Measurement Lab. And if you were here for the opening remarks, you remember that I referred to the Measurement Lab report. So um, I, I think we should certainly thank Colin for, for um, actually he was one of the primary, or it, I think the primary author on that report. So uh, we definitely owe him some thanks for certainly um, getting this discussion going with data. Um, that was some of the first data we saw on this, on, on this topic. So uh, excellent, glad to have Colin here as well. Um, then we have uh, uh, Christopher Yu, who's a professor of law, communication, and computer information science at uh, University of Pennsylvania. He's also the director for the Center uh, for Technology, Innovation, and Competition. Um, we're very lucky to have uh, Chris back here with us. He's um, spoken at CITP before, I think, uh, before my time, but I, I enjoyed the video um, uh, about uh, topics such, uh, such as the um, Comcast uh, Time Warner merger that um, didn't quite come to fruition. Uh, it had some very interesting things to say about that, among, among other things. And he's another expert in the, uh, in the economics of interconnection and, and access networks. And then finally, uh, I'm very, very pleased to welcome Brian Rogan. Um, nice to see you again after quite some time. Um, so Brian is a, <coughs> a principal engineer and technical lead uh, for Google's content distribution network, uh, where uh, he's been for almost 10 years. Um, he worked on the founding team of Google's content delivery platform, uh, known externally as the Google Global Cache, or GGC. Uh, which is built to accelerate the delivery of content for Google and provide video streaming for YouTube. So um, if you haven't sort of put the pieces together here, I think we're going to have a very interesting discussion because we have um, both the access and uh, what the FCC uh, often calls the edge providers here on the panel. And we have some, some other uh, esteemed experts who um, I think it's fair to say have taken some pretty divergent opinions on, on the topics that we're about to discuss. So without further ado, um, let me um, let me uh, turn the mic over to Jason, and uh, looking looking forward to hearing the, the dis discussion here. Great, thanks a lot, Nick. And uh, you know, definitely um, compliment to you and the direction that you're taking CITP. You know, I never really attended any of these workshops until you joined, and I think they're really nice. And certainly, while we may not agree on every issue, and this is a great example of this workshop, it seems like a nice place to converge and convene a lot of thinkers and have a great discussion. So I think that's, that's uh, really nice. Um, I don't have any slides, so I just have some, some remarks that I'll kind of read through here. Um, you know, my personal take on InterConnect today, um, you know, which is really about the exchange of internet traffic, is that I think it's a widely misunderstood topic. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about why that is. But I think that forums like this one and just generally moving to more openness and objective measurement in particular uh, can really help to create better understanding and cooperation about uh, interconnect, which is obviously uh, an important topic. Um, I think as long as networks have exchanged traffic together, the predominant um, model has generally been um, you know, based on some level of fair economic exchange for that interconnection. 
Uh, I think recently there's been a lot of, um, you know, sort of maybe mistaken, um, you know, sort of nomenclature that's developed around what's settlement free versus free. And those are different things. And even though people think they're the same, they're, they're sometimes not. Um, and I think that throughout the, the history of the internet and true peering has been where each party has roughly had some equal exchange of value, whether that was equal balanced traffic or some other kind of form of economic trade uh, existed. And that created balance in the relationship. Um, on the other side, if you had a one-way uh, unidirectional kind of traffic flow, let's say you have a web server someplace and you're really sort of sending information, um, you have an imbalance. And that's why you've had um, other kinds of services, um, typically on a sort of paid transit basis, if you will, um, which is just sort of making up for that lack of economic balance or value exchange balance um, with something else of uh, value. Um, I think the other thing that's fair to observe is that we have a few of these folks in the room, but because there's such a small cadre of peering coordinators around the world, that the way that these agreements work um, is pretty opaque. Unless you're sort of within that small club of people doing this around the world, it's hard to understand how it works, and it takes a lot of time to figure that out. And oftentimes, things become misunderstood, I think, as a result of that. Um, and uh, I think also one of the reasons that we're here and, and one of the reasons that um, Nick made the earlier presentation is that I think Interconnect has tended to be undermeasured and that uh, in the absence of that objective and reliable data about what's really happening, people just tend to come to their own conclusions about what's going on and they will create um, you know, what they think are motivations for what's happening and so on. And in a lot of cases, those things are just really incorrect. Um, and so I think that that's an area that, that uh, you know, measurement can shine some light on this. And I think that we've started to see glimmers of this. Um, you know, the, the uh, earlier um, presentation about some of the, the data from the seven ISPs is one example of that. But I'm hoping that there'll be more things like that, more measurement of interconnection and so on. Um, and to sort of take an aside for a second, you know, I think if you look at the way that uh, traffic exchange is, is defined today, you know, you've got that bilateral uh, sort of balance, if you will, and that sort of, you know, traffic exchange, and then you have traffic delivery, which is sort of the website example that I gave. Um, and so you might say, you know, in a network like Comcast, you know, what kind of relationships do you have? You know, what, how does that look um, from a scale standpoint? And at Comcast, we have about 40 peers. Um, it's easy to look and see all the networks that we're interconnected with. I think Kevin and others mentioned, um, you know, that that's sort of open and easy to figure out. Um, and we tend to have link capacity at about 50% utilization at any given time. Um, and that process, um, even though this is not well known, when you have those relationships, they're generally jointly planned. So you're meeting every quarter, you're talking about traffic projections, people are doing long-term investment in that interconnection to make sure you don't have uh, congestion on those links. Um, but I think that that's another example, when you think about that utilization, it's something that people can say, well, is 50% good and 99% bad? Um, and I think this is another area where more measurement can help um, because I think that many people would say, you know, 99% link utilization is probably bad. Um, however, there are some peers, um, and it might depend on the kind of traffic that they bring to the mix, are very adept at running very high levels of utilization without affecting uh, end user uh, quality of experience. And so I think, you know, the measurement can provide some initial guidance, but you need to have experts um, at content providers and elsewhere that can bring more context to explain, you know, it's not always about utilization. There's a lot of other factors that are there. Ultimately, you're trying to understand what's a poor user experience, and this is one way that, that you might be able to shed a little bit of more, a uh, little bit more light there. For example, um, another example I think that uh, measurement can help in is understanding the nature of traffic flows and who kind of controls those traffic flows. And in some cases, um, you know, whether it's uh, you know, sort of MLabs data or other things you often have a one-way trace route, which is certainly valuable, uh, but seeing both the return path and the sending path, I think, is essential because um, the return path is sometimes where it gets much more interesting um, and uh, where, you know, if you only have the forward path, the story can be a little bit misleading. I think the other thing that people don't realize is how rapidly that return path can change, minute by minute, second by second, and that the return path um, that you might trace um, you know, today at 10 o'clock in the morning could be dramatically different at 10.05 or 11 o'clock uh, 
and that people um, you know, may be doing that for a variety of reasons. Um, it might be technical reasons, it might also be business reasons um, to try to gain leverage in a negotiation as an example. Um, but from an ISP standpoint, sometimes those very large shifts in traffic, especially for um, very large content sources, can sometimes also feel like a DDoS attack. Suddenly you're seeing this massive influx of traffic from an unexpected location, and that's affecting a lot of other user traffic um, and uh, obviously affects uh, end users. And so I think our thinking as ISPs is evolving about um, how we sort of sense and how we think about and react to those large traffic shifts. Um, so to wrap up on that point uh, of measurement, you know, I think that more precise, dependable, trustworthy measurement is an essential ingredient in better understanding what happens in Interconnect and how it really works. Um, and I think that will enhance the community's understanding of this and hopefully dispel a lot of the myths and perhaps mistruths that are out there about what's going on and really, you know, just sort of help in general um, in the community and, and sort of how the internet develops. Um, but the final thing I'd like to mention is maybe something more that, you know, Christopher Yu or other folks that are in the, the audience like Bill Lair and others that are economists can think about, which is I think that they're the, the topic of interconnect is not just a technical one, but an economic one. And that I think a more data-driven understanding of the prevailing economic model of interconnection and what changes if there's a shift away from the predominant model, those things are really important um, you know, discussions to have. I think it's fair to say at a high level that things like per gigabyte costs have been declining year over year, so I don't think there's a lot of um, a debate about that. And there have been a lot of things that have been created as a, you know, sort of that are part of that um, that are things like um, you know, content localization, and then obviously that drove the, the rise of content delivery networks for content distribu distribution. Uh, more bitrate efficiency and these kinds of things. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of technical economic interplay uh, that's going on there. But I think it's fair to say in this workshop that there is somewhat of a tension between some of these potential models, between the existing pr predominant model and, you know, what might be some alternatives um, to that as that might be uh, different models. And I think, unfortunately, from an e economic standpoint, people tend to only think about what the next move is, sort of one chess move ahead. Like, wouldn't it be great if this kind of paid link became a free link? What is, you know, that's great, and the conversation tends to end there. I think it's much more interesting, especially for the economist, to play that uh, four, five, six moves ahead and look at the whole board and say, are there economic signals that you lose, um, and is that good, good or bad? Are there potentially new economic signals that are created? You know, I don't know what those might be, but what, what might they be and how might they work? And for some of the ones that, uh, that are lost, for example, you know, do you lose an economic signal that might drive a large content provider to, say, re-encode their content into a more um, bitrate efficient uh, delivery? Um, you know, it's hard to say. Uh, there are probably a lot of costs that shift around. And is that a good or bad thing? I don't know. But they're going to shift some places. And where are those places? And what, what are the implications there? And I think there, that means there's a big role for economists to play and study the what ifs and play that you know several moves ahead on the chessboard, so to speak. Um, so just to wrap up, I think you know the internet uh, uh, interconnection marketplace is not very static. It's it's continually uh, continually evolving. Um, it's both evolving technically. I think the economics are evolving. Certainly the information about it's evolving. We saw some data shared today. Uh, so there's an information aspect there that's evolving. And you know, I think at a minimum, one of the things that we'll start to see over the next couple of years, and I hope to be a part of it um, to help that happen more and more, is that we will have more and more measurements, more openness in general about how interconnection is working. And um, you know, I think it's anyone's guess where that goes eventually, um, but it should be very interesting to see and be interesting to be a part of. So thank you. So uh, Nick so, sort of seeded the discussion and, and prompted uh, a discussion on M where MLab is going. I think that actually, uh, given the announcement this morning and c coming from the perspective of MLab's parallel research on interconnection performance, it's useful at this moment to reflect on where we are in measurements and the structural con uh, considerations that will uh, define potential future efforts, essentially. Uh, I kind of 
you know, sitting there started to think through that existential question of where does MLab, uh, where's MLab play a role, you know, given the sorts of research that we're seeing developing. So just as a, a sort of a, a, a quick debrief, MLab is essentially a globally distributed open access platform. We host a number of tests, including tests that are developed by people in this room, uh, to fundamentally measure uh, end consumer broadband performance. MLab uh, sort of values transparency, values open source values, and so uh, in effect, the requirements are, you know, it has to be consumer, uh, consumer measurement and the, the uh, data that's created has to be released into the public uh, domain in, in some force. So we have a number of tests such as, uh, uh, that we host like the network diagnostic tool, which is essentially a simple throughput test. When we have uh, over 100 uh, sites, uh, hosted, uh, located on different transit providers across the world, this all of a sudden starts to be useful uh, for looking at uh, uh, differences in topology, differences of performance that are based off of, uh, um, you know, the networks involved. Uh, I, I take to heart, uh, especially in this case, uh, Nick's blog post on the limits on the tomographic ap approach in the first report, <coughs> as well as the continued need for MLab to expand infrastructure pr perspectives. We can maybe talk about that in the Q&A. I sort of wanted to talk about just basically where we're at though. After all, the, the study and transparency of inner domain uh, interconnection performance has come a long way over the past two years, particularly in a, an applied perspective, in a manner that is constructive for the public and for regulators. The sort of research and disclosures that we have today and the maturity of the conversation, particularly the one that we're, we're having in this room right now, probably would have not occurred recently. And there are a number of reasons for this shift. For one, it's the obvious. There's an increase uh, from national regulators and public interest organizations in the end-to-end -end health of consumer broadband performance in how our economies are powered. But I think that there are also secondary, or rather additional uh, uh, reasons for this shift. For example, the recognition of the utility of structural transparency in assuring uh, to the public good faith management within network consolidation agreements occurring uh, right now through uh, mergers and acquisitions, as well as the growth of voluntary cooperative agreements uh, amongst network segment providers and researchers, such as what was announced in order to reduce perceptions of opacity and contribute to a, a greater perspective of public dis disclosure, essentially what, what Jason was speaking on earlier. Uh, as with um, broadband measurement initiatives, I think that this research is now better understood as not necessarily an adversarial relationship between the collectors and the collected upon. Uh, and we might actually be settling into new norms of transparency. We might be creating them in the room today. I would suggest that we take it for granted, for example, that uh, initiatives like the Broadband, broadband America, or I'm sorry, Measuring Broadband America program um, uh, exist. And we perhaps even see it necessary and fun, a fundamental component of the FCC's activities. Why shouldn't a regulator uh, track such developments? Moreover, some in this room even use it as an advertising <coughs> opportunity, and rightfully so. Uh, what's interesting is, is in the first pass of this interconnection disclosure trend, the one that we saw in, in Europe, specifically in France, uh, the notion of, uh, of inter interconnection measurement was very bureaucratic. It was based off of paperwork. And now what we're seeing is a shift towards actual measurement. Um, that's, that's notable, that, that rare shift. Fortunately, there's also a wide set of tools in order to support direct and, and indirect um, methods of monitoring of interconnection. For example, uh, CADA and MIT's monitoring plan for the AT&T and DirecTV merger, and it's pa uh, the paper that it released, I think, last year called um, uh, Measurement and Analysis of Internet Interconnection and Congestion. Also, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I don't want to leave out the host, uh, Princeton's work on where's the fault and the cooperative research announcement uh, made today. Indirectly, we have a number of others. Measurement Lab is one. Ripe Atlas is useful in this respect. Sam knows as well. And other analysis of, of end consumer collection uh, efforts based off of particularly uh, vivisections of network performance data, amongst others. Uh, please forgive me for, for missing others. In fact, I think that 
that there is this breadth should be a measure of the success of especially academic research in responding to a public interest and public policy question. An open-ended research is important. Capacity alone might not be the issue at the root of interconnection-related performance characteristics. Uh, elsewhere within the MLAB data, for example, we see uh, network management practices and structural decisions that still has led to similar impediments to consistent and fa fast access. Most notable examples would be suboptimal routing policies and placements of interconnection points, uh, such as the failure to peer within country or at a certain location due to a perspective that performance can be used as market leverage, which appears to be in common, for example, in locations that are, are liberalizing from formerly state-controlled <coughs> telecommunication sectors. As a result, there's a cl uh, continued need globally uh, for performance uh, measurement on interconnection capacity and practices in order to quantify and define the scope of impact of, of these policies for reasons such as uh, to support the growth of inter internet exchange points and participation within IXPs by actors that would not otherwise be inclined to cooperate, as Jane described so well earlier, uh, as well as to enable consumers to make education, educated decisions within a competitive market and to understand their own connectivity, as well as, and finally and obviously, to provide national regulators and public interest organizations the ability to understand national networks in order to, to uh, you know, to follow regulatory and cooperative opportunities for performing, uh, improving performance. So we as a community are close enough to solving the interconnection monitoring question from a pure technical perspective. It's useful to think of the problem backwards from the final state. Uh, what would an ideal solution be that, uh, look like? What is still missing? And how do the resources required for scale and business sensitivities constrain our, our perfect uh, solutions? I think, you know, as far as an, uh, the existential question for MLAB, this is where we start to come in. Because as, as was mentioned earlier, if such information is considered confidential and subject to contractual limitations, how do we acquire actual information and not, as, as Nick described it so well, kill a researcher negotiating with ISPs? Most of these options appear also to be you know, research intensive approaches that require cooperation and contribution of staff time and infrastructure report, uh, support from networks, which cannot be assumed on a global scale. I, I think that we have a great deal of privilege and access and, and maturity within especially the providers in the room to participate. Uh, you know, again, as we saw from, from the ISOC presentation, this is, not, this is not going to be the case globally and consistently. Hence, my argument is that there will always be a structural need for third-party monitoring from crowdsourced measurements from end users and without the prerequisite from, of direct cooperation from intermediaries. This is still important in circumstances even where the business climate and sort of the social climate that we've built from, uh, you know, from the communities through Nanog and Wright, for example, is amenable to monitoring. As a first indication, for example, this, this might provide a first indication of where to look for problems, how to set up structures, how to challenge the structures that we put in place for measurement. But it also provides for an external check on the integrity of systematic monitoring efforts. Essentially, we have to still assume, trust, but verify. However, these initiatives especially will be uh, necessary where norms don't exist where we haven't sort of created these, these structures in the first place, or the expectations, where intermediaries might not be recept receptive, or where the, the infrastructure may be, on, may be beyond the reach despite a good intention. So I think that the, it's particularly necessary uh, to continue these efforts because we don't want to uh, perpetuate a disparity in network management practices that relegate certain regions into restricted access regulatory failure, and continued suboptimal access to the networks that drive modern economy. I think that that's where MLAB comes in, because some of these, you know, we're going to continue to, to hit at issues of scale. So I, I kind of, that's where I wanted to start off. I think that there's a lot of room for the Q&A, but you know, this is, these are the sort of thoughts that I had coming out of the, the morning presentation.
I do not have a VGA port on this thing. I don't have the dongle. I'm sorry? Yeah, put, do it on your laptop. Yeah. I sent them to you? Yeah, I did. That will be fine. There's no fancy animation. So thank you. The organizer comes to our rescue. So uh, I'd like to thank, every, thank you for inviting me to here I, to this event. Uh, I'd like to join everyone else in congratulating um, Nick and the program here and for the ISPs cooperating with this venture to put this information together. I mean, this is the kind of cooperative effort that I think is very important and is uh, going to help me push us forward in our uh, discussions at this point. Uh, just while <coughs> so I'm vamping here, um, I do. Uh, are we up over there? Uh, sort of, but I, let, me, let me see if I can. Um, I teach at the University of Pennsylvania where we're actually creating joint degree programs between law and engineering on the principle that we need to train a new kind of professional. It's been fairly obvious to me with principal training in the law that uh, lawyers need to understand the technology better. What's been fascinating to me is, is, and gratifying to me is the engineering community understands that they need to understand the, the business and the politics better. I mean, you used to be able to clear out a room of engineers just talking about the politics or money. Uh, uh, they now, we're realizing more and more that that is an important part of the process and that in fact, uh, you only need a bunch of innovators to lose their businesses over and over again for them to start to realize that there's an important thing that needs to be appreciated. Right? Uh, apropos of the first panel, I'm also, we up? So, if you don't need, I can mirror them or, I don't know, down arrow will, down arrow will do it. Okay. I'm glad there's people here more technically adept than I. Let's just um, mirror the display. Apropos of the first uh, panel and some of the discussions, I'm actually involved in a major initiative to do on connecting the unconnected, uh, which is to use the microphone. Sure. Here we go. Here we go. Now <laughs> to, you can see it there. Yeah. To study um, innovative, uh, an empirical study of innovative strategies to connect the to to connect the three and a half billion people who aren't connected now. Uh, we're doing this to support, among other things, Joe Halls at CDT. They're one of our partners. I've spoken with Don Ross Thacker, who's going to speak later at A4AI. ISOC has been involved. This has been, and Comcast has been supportive. It's been a very uh, wonderful adventure, and I think that it's something potentially very helpful. And is there any chance we can get the projector on this side to work as well? All right, just so, um, just to go begin, to start off, what's interesting to me is interconnection disputes tend to be framed as a, a dispute between two interconnection partners. That you have a link, you have one person side trying to provide traffic into it, they're provisioning in the link, and they're talking about, is that price proper? And in fact, you'll, you'll still tend to frame that dispute in isolation. In fact, I think if you think about this in economic terms, and I guess that's my job here to do, that's not really the right way to think about it, which is that's uh, the w when you think about the economics of an interconnection decision, you have to understand what their alternatives were at that point. And that simply by looking at the price charge between two parties doesn't really take it into account. Um, uh, from an economic standpoint, what you think about first is if there's a deal, is there an, what they call an overlap of reservation prices? Is it mutually beneficial? Is there value to be created by doing business together? The second part of it is if there's value to be created between the two of you, how are you going to divide it up? And that's where all the disputes come in, and there's a, a variety of negotiating tactics that you can use. But the interesting thing is the real determination of where you fall in that spectrum usually depends on your bargaining power, and, uh, and that's partly the cost of delay, but also partly of what's your next best alternative. Because if you've got an alternative, you simply won't tolerate those sorts of, uh, any, there's a, a price that you just won't go beyond. So really, when you think about an interconnection agreement, you actually have an alternative, which is not only other interconnection agreements, but in fact, you can think about in routing through uh, different peering partners as uh, finding another route, and that's the next cheapest alternative to you. In fact, that limits the leverage that a person can put on you. As Jason points out, there are 40 peering routes into uh, providers such as Comcast as one example. Interestingly, there's about 8,000 uh, transit routes into Comcast as well, as according to publicly announced uh, statements. And so understanding the real impact in a negotiation is going to be limited by that in an important way. But what's fascinating to me is, in fact, those are only the network-based ways we can think about how this, might, uh, how this might change. In fact, prior to uh, the Netflix Compass dispute, uh, Netflix was routing through third-party CDNs. And so, in fact, not even through an interconnection agreement at all, but actually by distributing through a CDN alternative has um, different uh, latency characteristics, different benefits, but in fact is a real alternative which, people, which uh, can provide adequate service. 
Uh, they can also self-provision their own data centers, which is uh, an always a possibility for large venue, uh, for large providers. And the most interesting to me is they can actually even do short of doing full-fledged data centers. They can do things what, such as what Netflix is doing with Open Connect, just by placing a small box of a fairly modest cost in a, a localized storage facility. And so we start to realize, if you want to understand the real nature of, of interconnection disputes and how we should be analyzing them, we can't just look at individual links and see what the congestion state is and the prices are. You actually need to think about the full range of alternatives to understand really how this negotiation is going to unfold. And unfortunately, the modeling that we have, I'm, this is not intended to be uh, a criticism of people who are measuring the individual links. That is a necessary, important part of the information set being done by MLab, being done by Princeton, by, done by MIT and other people. But the point is, how do we incorporate that data into a much fuller set of information that actually captures the dynamics in ways that be uh, helpful? The other thing that's really interesting to me is, um, as, as uh, Kevin mentioned earlier, it's a network of networks. One of the real characteristics of networks is, um, is the ability to uh, route around different problems. In fact, there's, uh, that you, what we discover is, in fact, congestion in one part of the network actually may trigger cascade congestion not in that part of the network, but in someplace else as you route traffic through different paths. And we have to think about this as a systemic effect. So one of the interesting things is, yes, it's important to manage congestion state within particular ISPs and links. But beyond that, you know, as, as Nick pointed out uh, in his earlier, in his opening remarks, in fact, we have to think about the prioritization policies, such as what Cogent implemented against Netflix in uh, January, February of 2014, which is very interesting because we have to understand that that's not just a product of the, the ultimate performance is not just a product of the interconnection agreement, but in fact, the decisions of the upstream ISPs about how they get it there. But the missing interesting problem here is we really need to also capture the decisions about how to route traffic around through the network through other paths. So it's not just studying the links and the congestion state and the status that, that different operators place among it. That congestion state is an artifact of decisions of how other people have placed traffic into that network. And they had choices. They could have done that path, they could have done some other path, and that in fact, we should expect them to operate that in a strategic manner. Now, uh, one of the great things I thought that Joe's presentation did this very nicely. In fact, um, I, uh, I actually had to work on this, it predates by four years, but I will openly acknowledge that that was built on work done by uh, Bill Laird, Dave Clark, and some other people at MIT that really tried to study this as a much more complex phenomenon with multiple routing paths as we've left the hierarchy structure. And what you discover is that, in fact, individual actors have a wide range of reasons for routing things along paths other than the BGP shortest path. So one is load balancing to maximize committed rate on both your links just to minimize costs. One is um, different forms of cost minimization to avoid transit links altogether. Uh, you try to maintain ratios where if you're about to get out of ratio on the shortest path, you might deliberately dump traffic through a longer link, not because you're trying to hurt the traffic, but just because you're trying to minimize costs for the overall system. In addition, if you're in a position where you have to do that, it makes sense for you to, to delay the traffic that is the most delay tolerant in a way that satisfies consumers. And all these things are being done in a much more sophisticated way. Now, the big kicker to all this is beyond those things that are optimizing the network, lowering costs, and ultimately yield and user benefits, there are opportunities for opportunistic behavior that are purely driven by the business interests of the individual actors. And what we have in a distributed information network, this is not bug, this is feature, this is an inevitable part of this. What we have to do is engineer the system and the contracts in it in a way that actually take, ha harness those incentives so they work for our benefit, not work against us. And in fact, that's one of the new tricks, but the problem is modeling this. Um, I, did some, I did a book on graph theory and actually trying to model behavior with each one acting independently. The problem is you then have to create payoff structures for each of the nodes to decide how they're going to behave to each one and then try to find an equilibrium and the modeling problem is just extraordinarily hard. And so, I mean, to say that this is the next step we have to do isn't to say that it's a tractable solution. And in fact, in a, cl in a classic uh, multi-node graph, you can actually think about it in terms of sources and sinks. You can do a one-way graph solution pretty easily. You can do a two-way graph solution, sort of. But if you actually have multiple points where you're exiting that go beyond one source and one sink, it's almost an intractable problem. So in fact, we're going to have to probably do some sort of micro studies of the economic incentives as opposed to some global solution of optimization, not the least of which is no one's going to see all the information on this entire network to, to optimize the whole thing anyway. And so it's a wonderful set of problems. So the most concrete example of what I'm talking about is the MIT data that happened to take place in the months leading up to and during the complex Netflix interconnect direct interconnection decision. 
And what you see here is, um, if you, uh, to explain the graph, you see there are three transit links in this Bay Area connection between, uh, between the transit uh, links into Comcast uh, through Cogent, Teta, and Level 3. And there's two things, and to explain what these are, these are daily data. Each dot represents the number of hours in any particular day that transit link was in a congested state. So you'll see on the bottom, there's a bunch of times where the transit links were completely uncongested on a particular day for zero hours in a day, and a, a wide array of different uh, data up the scale where it was two, four, six, eight, and up to a high of almost 18 hours a day. And that's what this data represents. Now, the two things that are quite striking about this, one is the general upward trend that, in fact, over this monitoring time, there was more congestion happening on this network. And in, as an aggregate, ignoring the colors of the dots, what you see is an upward trend in the number of links that are in a congestion state. The, the really, really interesting thing about this is uh, uh, what you look at is which of the three different transit providers were in congestion at a different time. The, the fastest way to see this is simply to look at the bottom or at zero, and you see that, in fact, you see uh, the cogent links were in an uncongested state in the beginning. All of them were in an uncongested state at the end after the direct interconnection agreement solved all this problem, which tells us this was probably a net benefit for a lot of consumers. But between the blue and the green, what you see is a very interesting dichotomy, which is in the beginning you saw a Tata links being almost completely uncongested through June of 2013. Then, that tra then you see the Tata links all start becoming congested, and then the, the level three links being completely uncongested for a couple months. And then the, the level three links going back to being congested, and the Tata links going uncongested. So what we see here is beyond the overall scope of the data with an upward trend, what we see is congestion moving very sharply between Tata and level three in the months of, of roughly May of June, July of 2013. And the question is, is what is going on here? Now, I will posit this was not done by Comcast because this is traffic being put into their network by someone who chose a transit link to get in, unless they're doing something with the routing tables to try to force it some particular direction. And one of the interpretations given by the MIT study team is that, in fact, some upstream actor, whether it is the uh, original source of the content or some other provider who had control over how this content routed in, was making decisions about on what was in their interest on how to route things in. So this is, to me, the, the, the point that I was trying to make earlier, which is we have to understand the incentives not just of the interconnection partners, but of upstream actors who aren't even visible contract partners to the link to understand why the congestion state looked the way it does. And in some sense, you can't necessarily remediate this by, by intervening in the, inter the relationship, the contractual relationship between the two transit partners. Because to the extent to which this is being driven by someone upstream, then in fact, you, can't act, you can only influence their behavior indirectly and not directly. And there has to be a way to capture this in modeling if you're really going to get the economics right. And that's, um, I don't mean to suggest this is easy, but it is a danger that we tend to focus on the interconnection link and the partners to that and not understanding that in fact they're part of a whole system that in fact how they decide to configure that link will cause routing decisions through other parts of the network that also have to be taken into account and endogenized. Frankly. So what would I say, my closing thoughts? One, I do think we need to take, try to think about this not in terms of just the congestion state of one particular ISP or one particular link, not that that's not important, it's critical, but we have to move beyond that to understand, really, to try to put yourself back into the, if you want to understand the economics of this, put it back in the decision-making position of the person who's trying to decide whether they're going to buy a transit link and how much they're willing to pay for it. Look at their full range of alternatives, topologically, architecturally, whether you can use storage or otherwise. Second is a point that I want to echo that Jason made earlier. I didn't know he was going to make it, but I think it's important, is that, in fact, zero price interconnection is barter. It is an exchange of equal value that, in fact, you have no compulsion to enter into a peering agreement, and you do this because it's a mutually beneficial exchange. It requires some, barter requires some notion of symmetry. We used to think about this purely in terms of traffic, in terms of nodes. I think the industry is moving beyond that to understand symmetry can work in different ways. Ultimately, it's symmetry of value. And that in different ways, that if, if it's valuable to you to get a traffic to a certain place, it doesn't necessarily matter proxy by on how much traffic you're going to do. And by doing this, it's, uh, you have to understand that if someone radically changes the volume they're sending you, for whatever reason, through a different set of interconnection agreements, 
Uh, most actual peering contracts, by their own terms, call for them to turn into transit tra tra contracts or there to be side payments. Because they understand once you're out of ratio, someone needs to have to start paying someone for the traffic because it's no longer a valid barter transaction. There's no longer an equal exchange. The other thing is to understand, when you have a situation like that, you always have one party that would rather pay less and one party that would rather be paid more. And that's, uh, the fact that you have two people disagreeing on price is not itself a problem, but you should also expect a degree of deadlock and holdout. That reminds me of how I bought my house. I made an offer just below full asking. Uh, my seller had the unorthodox uh, negotiating tactic of actually raise, going to the MLS, the multiple listing service, and raising the price. Um, <laughs> Uh, she said, uh, give me your best offer, and I raised my price a little bit, and she says, I need more money, and I need a later closing date. I said, I've bid against myself once, I choose not to do so again. <laughs> if you're serious about selling this property, write me a counter offer, and if not, I walked. And it wasn't, I wasn't, I had no market power here. She thought she could get a better buyer, or she thought she could get me, and um, I thought I could get a better seller, and she called me back two weeks later and said, I'll do it at your price if you can close in the state, and I bought the house. So my, this is normal, you know? On some level, people say, oh, they're not increasing capacity because they're trying to get, they're holding them up for a better deal. The answer is that is absolutely factually correct and economically benign. What you generally find is two people who have a good faith dispute on value, you get deadlock, both of you think you've got the hammer, one of you is wrong, and you find out. <laughs> and it's, you know, this is, part of a normal, functioning, healthy process. And we have to have a certain tolerance for disruption. And in fact, when you have a bargain like this, someone who had a deal before is going to lose it. They're not going to be happy about it. I don't expect them to be, but that's normal. I mean, as you see the dynamics change. And the last thing is, one of the, the strangest things, and, and I, I've actually really hesitate to state the statement, but it's on the slide, so I'll go ahead and do it. I'm going to actually use the word network neutrality for the first time in this conference. Um, one of the things that strikes me is we have been talking about that for a long time. Um, the interconnection part was not even in the proposed rules. It came out full cloth during the proceedings, and in fact, at the, or the judicial, at the oral argument, they were criticized, did everyone have enough notice of this? But this is uncharted territory, and the FCC's order gives us precious little guidance. And one of the things is this whole conference is about we don't really understand this this well. I'm actually worried about, there is a, a realistic, there are studies that show that potential overhanging liability will affect negotiations. If someone thinks they'll do better through litigation, that sets the floor on the reservation price, discounted by all the uncertainties. And I will say that I do think that that introduction of that into a regulated debate is actually changing, has the potential to affect uh, what used to be arms length negotiations in ways that are really hard to determine right now because nobody really knows, A, if that rule is going to survive, and B, even if it does, what it's going to mean. And so I actually really regret the way that's sort of been injected in a very late manner because there's really not been a great discussion about how that's going to play out. And that's why I'm so grateful that there are more like this that are actually going to explore it. All right. I'm, um, I'm going to give a little bit of a, a technical perspective. Um, about, about measurement and, uh, and how we build systems uh, around interconnect. Um, I think it's a little bit different than what we were talking about before. And I'm, I'm also going to try to give a little bit of a, a content provider perspective. I work for uh, one of those hyper giants we heard about earlier. Uh, it won't surprise you to know that uh, we probably account for something in the range of 20% of all traffic on the internet. Um, and so obviously uh, that, that, that is big scale and, and there's a lot of challenges to manage that. So in, in terms of the way that we think of interconnect, um, you know. We work to try to get our content as close to operators as possible. Um, AS15169, our autonomous system, uh, has an open peering policy. It's, uh, it's generally the, the, seen to be the best connected autonomous system uh, in the world. Um, we operate in, in north of 100 different facilities, uh, 50 metros. Uh, and, uh, and like Netflix, we also uh, operate a program that we call Google Global Cache, where we'll deploy caching uh, into any operator network that meets traffic minimums. Uh, we do thousands of those deployments, um, and, and in some cases, multiple of those deployments in, in, a, in a specific network. Um, so in terms of how we, we manage all of that, um, we built uh, a, bunch of, a bunch of systems to deal with that. Uh, we do a lot of this, um, this out-of-band traffic management, uh, so very little of our traffic is actually managed via BGP. Uh, we actively measure performance on, on the vast variety of different paths that we see um, into operator networks, and, and we we try our best to make optimal decisions based on that. Um, 
what we have uh, tended to find is that that problem is really easy when there's no congestion, uh, because you know, in a world of plenty, uh, finding the best path is, is a very straightforward problem, right? Um, it all gets interested. Uh, it's all, it gets interesting uh, when we see these kind of congestion issues. Um, in general, we, we are one of those providers who can who can try to run links at 99 percent. Uh, that's one of the the, the side effects of the, the system that we've built. Um, but the byproduct of that, uh, and it's worth calling out, is that that means that the traffic is going somewhere else, right? Uh, which may or may not be the, the best way for it to be sent, right? It generally means a longer and more circuitous path uh, to the user, and it generally means writing a path that's less likely to be provisioned uh, well to get to the user. And I think that's one of the things I want to bring out in, in kind of all of these discussions. I, I think we've been having this, this discussion a lot around kind of reachability and this basic notion of path diversity. But, but what you need to understand from the perspective of a large content provider, uh, it's all about capacity, right? Uh, and it's all about capacity on those paths. And, and if you're a large content provider, uh, the set of options that you have is actually much smaller uh, because the fact of the matter is that you need scale on any one of those choices. So yeah, we may have choices, uh, but in general, uh, you know, we, we will have to make a, a, hundred, a hundred like mini choices, right? Send traffic along a hundred paths to make up for having one well provisioned path, right? Um, we operate a fairly sizable team uh, at Google that looks at this problem exactly, that tries to understand what congestion looks like on the internet, uh, where it is, um, and, and what's going on there. Um, we look you know, all the way from the, the peering edge, the point at which we interconnect, uh, down to the access network to, to the, the greatest extent that we can. Um, and we also have this unique position of, of not needing to rely on active probing because we can collect lots and lots of passive information. We instrument every connection that a user makes to Google. We measure its performance. Um, for a subset of connections, we even do very, very detailed analysis down to the transport level, like looking at literally uh, inter arrival time between packets. Um, so, so needless to say, um, for our own purposes, like the, the network is, is quite well instrumented. Um, what we've found in, in looking at that, and, and obviously our ability to detect problems goes down the farther away from us they are, both because the, the user populations get really sparse uh, and because, yeah, uh, we, we, basically because the user populations get very sparse. Um, what in effect we found um, is that the vast majority of, of kind of degradations that we see um, are, are very close to the peering edge, uh, are very close to us, either, either kind of uh, one or two steps uh, beyond. Um, we generally find that the vast majority of issues um, come from a very small number of, of networks. Uh, and so it is the case that you know something north of 95% of the time, everything is fine, right? Uh, and then we generally tend to find that where we have problems uh, sending traffic to a network, uh, we have that problem through many paths. Um, it is not, not just one. Uh, and so then we also see uh, a more limited amount of, of congestion that we would typically attribute to uh, a downstream operator's backbone. So we've passed off traffic, and then they're trying to uh, send it to their users. Uh, we don't find, in general, that in the average case uh, this is a significant issue. We find it is an issue when we say, bring a link to 99% and then send the traffic down what we would all kind of consider a, a less than optimally localized path, right? Um, finally, uh, a big part of our program is, is doing everything we can to, to surface this information that we collect uh, back to ISPs and back to our partners. Uh, so we have a certain amount of data that we expose publicly through the YouTube video quality report. Uh, and then we have a corresponding set of tools that we publish back to ISPs that allow them to dig into that data uh, at very fine granularity down to kind of the prefix level and, and down to their network topology level. Uh, and increasingly we're working that as we get better and better to find what's interesting in that data to expose it back to, to operators and, and to proactively draw attention to it. Um, yeah, so in terms of what that means for us building a CDN, like I said, the, the mapping problem really isn't hard without constraints. Um, and so, but, but we, uh, we need to invest significantly in engineering because in the, in the rare cases that the constraints exist, uh, they're very significant to the user, right? Um, and we really do, we really believe that, that the best thing that we can do as a content provider is carry the traffic as far as is possible and get it as close to the user as possible to make sure there's as little network downstream from us uh, as is possible. So. Um, that's sort of, uh, th th those are the remarks that I had, and uh, I guess I'll leave it to the panel discussion. Okay, uh, yeah, we can, take, we can take Bill's question first while I sit up here. You said something 
announcement of the day to the NICAD, which <coughs> basically, um, what, you know, when you see these, it's not on a single path. So that would tell me that um, a data set that, that, you know, told me there are two bridges between um, the, the two ASs, um, and there's not congestion on the two bridges, basically tells me that there probably isn't congestion on either of the bridges. That's sort of a simple interpretation of what I, I thought I heard you say. Uh, I, th I, think, I think it's backwards, so, which is to say, uh, if the two bridges are congested, then all of the secondary streets are probably also congested, right? Um, it, it, is, it is not to say that if oh, okay. one of the two bridges right. is not congested, that, that, that neither is, right? Okay. Okay, great. So uh, definitely, uh, I think we, we have, uh, um, thanks, thank, thank you a lot to the panelists for all their views. I wanted to kick off uh, with some questions now. Um, one of the questions I think that we discussed in preparation for the panel was talking about um, what are the main mysteries uh, surrounding the interconnect today? You know, what don't we know? What kinds of additional measurements uh, do we need uh, to demystify them? So I, I thought um, Chris's um, comments uh, about Koja, Tata, et cetera, were quite interesting. And um, for those of you who, who haven't read uh, Bill Norton's Hearing Playbook. Um, it's a fascinating read. Uh, um, and uh, this is, you know, ostensibly, uh, well, this is one thing that, so Bill Norton, for those of you who don't know, is a, he, he's founded Equinix. Uh, he's a, sort of an expert in peering. And uh, one of the things he talks about in this uh, paper, the Peering Playbook, um, which is now a book, I think, um, he talks about basically if um, someone wants to force peering, uh, what they uh, and they have a lot of traffic to send, they can send traffic down uh, other uh, links of other transit providers. That, you know that, that those two um, uh, that those two networks basically that connect those two networks, um, thereby um, essentially um, in this case uh, you basically have a uh, sending a huge volume of traffic over say a transit that connects A and B. Um, at some point, B gets fed up and says, hey, let's connect. Um, and then at that point, some of the things that, that Chris was talking about, uh, you know, that's when we get into the, to the real fun. Um, so I guess one of the, uh, coming back to the question, um, what are the mysteries around interconnection? To me, this is one of the mysteries, I think. I'd like actually to hear what the panelists have to say about this. I'd, um, I think we heard a little bit from Chris already in his presentation. So. Um, le le let me maybe first direct it uh, to Brian and, and then maybe to Jason and, and then finally Colin uh, if, if others have folks I'd be very interested to hear what you think about these kinds of um, uh, plays in the playbook do you think they're happening um, do you think we do you think that there is it's possible to get measurements that would that would shed good light on this as opposed to as uh, Jason was sort of saying kind of wild speculation Sure, these kinds of plays are happening. Um, I, I would also say, though, that I think the <coughs> dynamics really do kind of change when you have these these large content providers. Where Google is bigger than, than many of these transit providers, right? Netflix is bigger than many of these transit providers, right? So this tactic is a lot less effective, right? In, in mm -hmm. the current world, to someone at that scale. Do you think that there are other uh, things going on? I mean, certainly we we heard from Chris about um, the you know. Um, those who who basically host the content can send traffic down uh, various uh, you know links of their choice. We don't really know too much about that uh, yet. Um, so do you, I mean, do you think that there are interesting other interesting things going on besides yeah, so, this? So, I mean, so certainly, back in the day, Akamai was was famous for this, right? Of of knowing when uh, when people were on ninety five five billing and just swapping back and forth fast enough that you hit your ninety fifth percentile on on multiple paths, right? Um, I don't see nearly as much of, of fun stuff like that, and, and it's it's more become the stuff of like of internet legend now, right? I, I mean, I think mm -hmm. that the capacities now are that are required by by a large content provider are so large that I really think the the set of tricks that you can pull like this, if if you still want to deliver that traffic for your business, are dramatically less mm -hmm. than, than lower than they once were, right? I, I mean, that it was really uh, exploiting like a, a unique kind of much more hierarchical market, right? Okay. So, J uh, Jason, what do, you, what do you think about this? Are you seeing things that look like this? Or are you seeing other things? And I guess a follow-up to that, I mean, certainly to follow up from this morning's presentation, do you think that um, 
it may be to ISP's benefit to release more data uh, of this <laughs> nature that might, might shed more light on these types of questions? You know, I think so. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of these things are uh, wrapped up in you know, mutual NDAs, and so it's hard <laughs> to, uh, to reveal too much sometimes. But it, it, I think your question triggers a few points. I mean, certainly the peering playbook exists for good reason. You know, that's a playbook. It's tried and true, and all those tactics get used. There's no doubt about that. Um, and when you look at different charts of what's happening in different links and traffic moving to one provider or another, you know, you never quite know, you know, did that shift predate, um, say, a negotiation meeting by a day or... You know, what did the traffic shift somewhere where it's known it causes a downstream provider a certain amount of cost? So it's sort of like, you know, pushing to cause a little bit of pain to see you know, how much did this hurt and I could do that more and make it worse if you wanted. Um, you know, so there's all those kind of interesting games that go on, which is fascinating to me. Um, but I think as well, I think, um, you know, Brian mentioned this with the citation of 20% of traffic, um, you know, Google representing that. I think that the one thing that's sometimes overlooked is that when you get to a certain level of scale, that that also brings a certain level of, I think, responsibility to the internet to be a good actor. Um, because if you can shift, you know, say 20 or 50 or whatever percent of the traffic around, um, while that might suit your own individual business needs and maybe that's what's driving you economically, you're having all of these secondary effects on other networks and other applications. Um, which can be really problematic and, and are just sort of, you know, a side effect of collateral damage of that kind of a rapid shift. And I think ISP's views of those shifts are starting to change. You know, I mentioned starting to look at those things more as like a DDoS kind of an event um, because it has this secondary effect that's really problematic for users. Um, and certainly networks that are doing those kind of shifts are very well instrumented. They know what the effects are not just to their traffic and their end users um, but to others. Um, so I think it's interesting. But I think the, the other thing, when you see those peering playbook things happen, it's not just because of a point in time uh, economic decision that's being made. It's often because there's a shift um, or maybe a maturation in some of the players that's happening that's maybe not that apparent. I mentioned this at one of the breaks to, to Bill and some others. Um, you're oftentimes seeing, say, someone that's moving from hosting traffic at Akamai, uh, hosting content, let's say, to maybe then eventually saying, hey, maybe they want to have some of their own data centers, maybe they're going to do direct links. And that really is a reflection of someone reaching a certain level of scale and success in the marketplace and maturing and then wanting to take things that might be variable costs to more fixed costs. Um, and so there's a lot of things that, that uh, change. And oftentimes, I think, in the debate, we seem to focus on this middle ground of uh, when there's this sort of tension in the model not really stepping back and saying, no, wait, what's happening? This is, there's a reflection of a maturation in the player. It's almost like someone's coming, you know, coming out to the ball, and uh, you know, that's, uh, mm -hmm. that's interesting. So I think that's all I say. But by the way, I do want to compliment Colin, who I think you know, with the, the great uh, you know, blog post that he wrote as you dug into some of the MLabs data, you know, he needs sort of like a, a badge, you know, internet detective or something like this. Because <laughs> uh, nobody really had the time to dig into that. And it was fascinating because, you know, we found that. And, you know, as an ISP, when we saw that, that report come out, we were as well scratching our heads like, how did that happen? You know, we signed the deal, but this traffic got suddenly better for all these other providers. How does that work? And, you know, great, uh, great finding because we have, you know, he mentioned before the value of, of academic researchers. And I think that's an example where they have the expertise to dig into those kind of data sources and they've deployed these kind of things and, you know, can be informative. Well, so I, I think to sort of go off of that, you know, there's a spectrum at play here, right? Between Jason's comments and Nick's comments. Jason's perspective is we have a certain understanding as being a part of uh, one part of a, a mutual NDA and we can make assumptions or beliefs based off of how traffic shifts and our understanding from that perspective of the, N, uh, the NDA. Uh, but that really speaks to the limits of being a third party. And that's sort of the perspective also of, of Nick saying, hey, can we open up some more of this information? Because ultimately, you know, I'm not even a part of, of either side of that. And so I have even less information in, uh, in this respect on the business layer. And, and I think that um, the quote that was put up there with not really uh, had, had an, a, a very important prefix that, uh, preface that, that we put up on a number of occasions, which is you know, we can say that there are characteristics on this network. 
we can say that uh, based off of, uh, of the methodology that we've applied here and then privately some of our own vetting based off of other methodologies that we believe that, that this degradation or this performance characteristic is based off of non-technical reasons that there are <coughs> business or contractual <coughs> elements in play. However, there's no like, uh, you know, like uh, business dispute bit, right? There's no like <laughs> the type of service type of degradation where it's saying, you know, like hearing playbook <laughs> number 12. Um, so, so ultimately that, what measurement can do is prompt a conversation and hopefully the individuals who are direct parties have the ability uh, to clarify or provide their own information into that. And so that's the perspective also of saying, uh, you know, the benefit of, of dragging in some of, the, some of the people who are involved. And I think that, for example, Kojic coming into the conversation and explaining it is, is a measurement success and also defines the limitations and the role of measurement in this conversation. Uh, and I, 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 I'm very proud, for example, uh, that, that the interconnection report was cited by all parts of the spectrum of parties to the open internet uh, uh, um, docket, right? You had public interest organizations who were arguing that this is, I'll use it the second time, a net neutrality issue. And then you had, you know, individuals who were saying, okay, this is, this is a, you know, this is a broad environment. There are economics in play. Uh, but ultimately, what we could at least do is, is start to try to assert a factual basis for this conversation and provide some sort of perspective. For the record, we, we did invite Hank to the panel. Uh, <laughs> I didn't hear back. Um, so uh, coming, coming, I think, to another point that um, that Chris made, I, th I, th I think he made a really nice point in his, his presentation that these things happen. You know, this is just the way business negotiations work. Um, you know, you know um, nothing is necessarily wrong here. Um, so I wanted to sort of bring up a, a recent example of a um, peering dispute. Um, I thought this one was particularly entertaining because I gave a, a, a lecture on interconnection in my <coughs> undergraduate networking class, and we talked about business relationships, peering disputes, and it's hard to have such a discussion without talking about cogent. And I made some joke that, you know, cogent will probably be in the news in the next week or so, and lo and behold, they were. Um, and we, we saw this just a, uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, so this is, is basically, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, this is what hearing disputes sometimes look like. Um, uh, this one is interesting because it's sort of a preemptive peering dispute almost. Um, and this is also interesting, I think, because it's about IPv6, which um, apologies to those of you who came to Princeton hoping to get on the internet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, so I, I, I wanted to use this as a context for, for, uh, the, for uh, the next question, which is um, I think Chris is right to say that Okay, these are just business negotiations, etc. On the other hand, I think on both sides of the equation, we have um, both edge providers and access providers who um, have incredible market power. Um, on the content side, we have um, you know lots and lots of people who want to get to Google and Netflix. And on the access side, um, I think it's quite fair to say that competition is extremely limited in in, in a lot of access network markets. So um, that second point does provide some leverage to the access provider when these disputes arise. So I was um, hoping to maybe get some thoughts from, again, both um, Brian and Jason about that. What, what is your view on uh, situations like this? Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> answer I, I, that I as you choose. Way, this is as absolute, absolutely a diplomatic answer as I could possibly have given. <laughs> it's an open interconnected <coughs> policy that welcomes any network to pair with us. Yeah. Um, and, and you should visit peering.google.com, which is my team. But, um, Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> but, but no, I, I mean, I would say, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I certainly think that in terms of kind of the, the leverage, especially in, in the U.S., I mean, it would be unfair to deny that, that access providers have a, a, a unique leverage, right? I, I mean, we'll, right. we'll send our traffic to anyone. And I think, you know, even, even shades of the, the last kind of question, right? I mean, there is certainly one class of kind of commercial trickery that has become well appreciated by uh, 
content provider and networks, right? And it is the uh, constrain all access uh, into my network in an attempt to get you to pay peer with me, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that, that is definitely, oh, I like the, the sitting back there. <laughs> um, I mean, that, that, that is definitely a trend that <coughs> we've seen over the last five or 10 years. And, and I think uh, we would certainly, it, it would certainly <coughs> explain some of the things that we observe, right? Yeah, so I guess, um, I mean, are we seeing uh, I mean, to question to Jason, I mean, are these things uh, abuse of, of sort of market power, would you say, or uh, is this just a natural well, kind of evolution? Well, looking at the IPv6 one here from the, I guess that's from the Nanog list, I have to say, first off, I'm pleased that it has nothing to do with us. Uh, <laughs> so that in and of itself was awesome. Um, but, uh, you know, beyond that, I think it's interesting because um, it, obviously it's a new protocol. There's not a lot of traffic that... Um, is on there. I mean, I think we're projecting maybe by end of year, maybe half of our traffic would be IP, IPv6 based. And if v6 wasn't there, you know, maybe you could use v4. But you know, I think it potentially, um, you know, some players in the ecosystem. I mean, this might be one example. Are trying to say, you know, is this a way to change some of the dynamics? You know, the, the change to this sort of newer protocol, um, and we'll see how some of that stuff plays out. It's certainly, you know, interesting to watch. And unlike a traditional uh, peering dispute where it's sort of like, hey, this traffic get is blocked or, or is degraded. It's a much more subtle form because you can still get to that same content over on BB4. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how it uh, how it changes potentially. I don't know. Any other comments? So what's interesting is, um, well, first I, I should have mentioned this earlier. I actually um, go by Christopher, not Chris. My wife is named Chris. Sorry about <laughs> and that. And it makes uh, very strange conversations when telemarketers call our house. So um, what I would say is um, there's an interesting question about uh, the nature of the market power that may be enjoyed by, that are enjoyed by last mile providers. And to a large extent, you know, actually uh, John Nectarline, who's the general counsel of the FTC, and I just wrote a paper that in a sense says that that depends on whether you're trying to reach an actual person for a person-to-person -person connection, or if you have an advertising-based business trying to reach a large number of people. In the sense that, in some ways, if you're doing an advertising-based business, your ability to reach a particular individual is actually not that important. You're looking at the amount of the total market that you can reach and you can uh, connect to them. And in fact, there's a follow-on piece I'm playing around with, which is uh, there's an old fight you know, that uh, Andy Litchko wrote a great paper on, is Metcalf's Law wrong? And one of the things they contrast it with is, is the old Sarnoff's Law, which is linear. Actually, if it's advertising-based, the value may well be linear. Because it's the total number of connections, not the interconnections that ultimately matter. And in fact, that's one of these things I'm playing around with right now. What we discover is that if it's an advertising base, it's not the local reach that matters. It's the national or the global reach that matters. And that in fact, the ability, that, you know, the idea that one advertising venue would reach, you'd love to get 100% distribution just like a shoe sale, shoe manufacturing company would. It rarely happens on, you know, or directly through the complex web, maybe slightly through different routes. But what I would say is that to say that they, put a different way, they ha uh, Comcast has, for example, about south of 30% of the, of the US-based internet connections uh, globally. And in terms of the negotiation with end users, I have Comcast and Verizon's alternatives and a growing number of 4T LTE wireless that are trying to bump around. We'll see what happens with that. But more importantly, if you're talking about the bargain not between Comcast and the end user, but the Comcast and the upstream provider. There, if it's the national reach that matters, then they're basically a 25 to 30 percent market player, which, in conventional bargaining terms, is decent leverage, is what we, but not what we normally associate with monopoly leverage. And so, what you can see is um, a weird example of this is to go from the internet to actually the traditional cable television market, where you see these distributed cable companies, which have 25 percent or less of the market. Bargaining with um, studios, five or six studios with national reach, and their content acquisition costs are going up much faster than cable connection costs, which tells me that those cable companies are losing that bargain. And in terms of relative bargaining power, there, the same reach they have isn't really generating the same sort of leverage that, for example, the content companies have on the cable side. Now, whether that translates to the internet side or not is not my, I can't, we don't have enough data to say. But what's interesting to me is that. It's easy to say that they don't, we don't have a lot of options in the end user facing market. That is a different market than the one in which last mile providers face content providers upstream. Well, and just to play off of that maybe a little bit and some of the 
uh, bargaining power and you know relationships. Um, you know, Brian's team maintains the video quality report for Google, which is you know actually really great for end users. They can see a nice chart of how their uh, qualities looked over time, and you know absolutely. You know, let's say that you're in a scenario where you know links are constrained and you know there's some challenge there. Customers become unhappy. They pick up a telephone and call their ISP. That equals cost to the ISP. Uh, some set of them, if it's an important enough application to them, uh, will decide to move to another provider that doesn't have those some same issues. Um, and so there's a lot of um, you know sort of end user uh, things that go on there. And believe me, in the middle of of um, you know major problems, let's say it's even just a technical problem like a fiber cut or something like that. You know there are very there's an extreme amount of pressure that develops uh, from end users to their their service providers um, because you know these applications and many of these providers are so central to their their daily lives online um, and having access to that content is is you know increasingly important to them. And so when there are problems with uh, accessing that and or it's degraded, it's not as good as it was. Um, you know, they certainly, uh, you know, complain about that and, you know, they expect to have, you know, really top-notch access. But it, I, I think that we have a, an educational failure because most consumers still believe that the internet is a cloud. And so all of this is obscured within sort of the extensiveness of the networks and the, the, the actors in play. And in a lot of these situations, there is not necessarily an understanding of accountability because there is not a, the right amount of tools that exist in order mm -hmm. to isolate that this is the causal factor yeah. in why there's a degradation. And so I think that you know that would be an optimal environment in which we could we had the ability to, to sort of place that. Uh, I for for one I, I want to mention by the way that one of the most impressive things about the open internet debate uh, over the past two years is how often and often annoyingly. Uh, the peering playbook was cited in public policy <laughs> conversations. <laughs> it was quite incredible. Um, it turns out to be pretty readable. I think that's the, the issue at stake. Um, <laughs> but, then, but then similarly, there, there's a lack of perspective, right? When we talk about there's this num number of networks, I, I took, you know, as a, as a salient point, Brian's uh, mentioning that when you are one of these larger uh, uh, content providers, you know, there are only a certain set of entities that you can deal with. And so there might be dozens and dozens of, of interconnecting partners or transit relationships, but how many of those scale? And to put it sort of in a more, much more simple way, uh, when you're an end consumer, the failure of one of those interconnection agreements or even one of those interconnection points might translate into a significant degradation of your service. And so, uh, so I think that lacking perspective and, and lacking the educational opportunities, we're just not in, in an environment in which the, the public uh, has the ability to really understand uh, what they're dealing with and uh, who's at fault and whether I should change that provider, whether I should go to another, or whether I should even uh, switch over the top services. Great. So we're, we're definitely running into lunch by a few minutes, and I, I don't want to keep people hungry. Um, but may, may, we haven't taken any questions from the audience on this one, so maybe if there's one question from the audience, maybe we can wrap, wrap up with that. Everyone is very hungry. I'll, I'll then, yes. The, the one uh, thing I would say, um, you know, I think Khan makes a good point about that sort of lack of information, and I think that's one area, as I said in my opening remarks, where measurement can really help. And the better and more reliable and high quality those measurements are, uh, is a big deal because there's a big difference between just sort of you know, throw it at the wall, you know, kind of measurement and something that's really well thought out. Um, and I think that is really informative and can really shed a lot of light on what's happening. And I think you know, data is often our friend, um, you know, speaking as an ISP. Mm -hmm. And I think also the, avail the mere availability of some of that data <coughs> has the potential to alter uh, some of the behaviors in the marketplace, which I think is really interesting. Um, so you know. The yeah. dynamics in the marketplace may shift over time as a result of it. Yeah, and one thing you mentioned earlier was the sort of good of the internet and the happiness of users, and we haven't even talked at all about quality of experience, but, but we did have a workshop on that here last fall, <laughs> um, but that's another can of worms. Um, on that note, it looks like we do have one question yeah. Yeah. from I, our, our I, friendly I, regulators. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Actually, I was going to, uh, very synergistic <coughs> to Jason's question, okay? Uh, we went through a lot of discussions with a lot of companies on the cogent Netflix congestion issues, and I can tell you after speaking to probably over a dozen companies, we came out with no firm conclusions uh, and a lot of questions. So my question, Jason talked about access to more data, 
I'd like to, and we also heard the word earlier, NDAs. So in order to really look at the issue, it seems to me, and I'll build on what Christopher said, that uh, you need more than just data. You need more than just traffic metrics. So I'd like to hear the panel comment on what sort of information should be available <coughs> on the business side of the equation. Because with just the network side, you really don't go anywhere. So I think that <coughs> the first answer is, you know, to try, if anyone can crack open NDAs, you can. <laughs> you know, I mean, on some level, asking us to do that is a strange response. You can make that a recommendation. Well, yeah. um, but the thing I fear is that once you get into the business relationships, you, you're still going to end up with large, you may have a hard time finding determinate answers anyway. And that, in fact, I think we can try to head off the most egregious of the behaviors to try to, to do this. But what I was struck with by, um, in Jason's initial comments, is how most of these interconnection agreements are negotiated on a cooperative basis. And I actually think that Brian's company and Jason's company really aren't the issue here. Because they basically are selling, dealing with large volumes. And they're projecting for growth. I mean, this isn't a one-shot game where we're going to opportunistically take it. You're, you're, these are partners for you. Years and years. Right, and there's going to be investments, and the question is who's going to pay for them? And the economist to me says it's going to be determined by elasticities, which is a number of alternatives. And the answer is um, Brian's company would love to pass all those costs off to Jason's company. Jason's company right. would love to pass them all to Brian's company. And based on the fairness and the general economics, it's probably somewhere in between. Based on the number of alternatives, and the lack of alternatives, in fact, is a feature, not bug, that provides a super competitive return that assuming you can actually do provisioning. It provides incentives for people to adjust and invest in more capacity to actually balance it out a little bit better. So what strikes me is the dynamic between large actors is relatively healthy. The occasional attempt to do short-run opportunistic behavior notwithstanding, they do happen. But I think eventually they, most people understand that that's self-defeating because content companies need great networks and great networks need great content. It's that simple. What I worry about is the smaller actors who may find opportunities to act in funny ways in between. And uh, one of the things that uh, we, I've always been struck by is, um, and Brian and I were talking about it briefly before, is, for example, there are, uh, there's a problem with UDP and the growing percentage of the traffic on UDP. Um, not all of it's TCP friendly. Uh, there are providers who are ramp or just openly offering fast UDP in ways that are opportunistically taking excess amounts of the bandwidth. And that is an incentive that we cannot control from the edge. I mean, it's, it, they're independent actors, and that's a problem. And we've got to figure out how to deal with it. Those are the kind of actors I worry about, is not the large companies who have an interest in a healthy ecosystem and will help make it sure it's the case. And I'm not sure that getting all the data you're looking for, Walter, is going to be any better than the fact that they have a shared interest in actually creating a healthy ecosystem. The question is, can we worry about the bad actors? Well, and even, Christopher, if you look at, um, you know, let's say you pried open one example NDA or one example deal, that only tells you about maybe that relationship at an edge, and maybe there's, say, you know, to make up a number, you know, maybe there's a million dollar, you know, kind of deal at the edge, it doesn't really talk to the maybe 10 or 100 times investment and cost that has to go through the rest of the network to make that happen at the edge. And sometimes people are looking at it in a very atomic sense or limited sense without looking at you know, all of the other uh, investments that take place at the same time. Great. Thank, let's thank our panelists. Uh, thank you very much. Great discussion.